This is the Louisiana Hometown Network, traveling the state to bring you the important issues and events. The Office of Sheriff has existed over 1,000 years and is the oldest law enforcement position in the U.S. The word sheriff is derived from the Shire Reeve, which hails back to England, where the land was divided into geographical areas called shires, and each shire selected a reeve, or guardian of the shire, eventually leading to the word sheriff as we know it today. In the United States, the rich history of the sheriff first began in Virginia in 1634 and in Louisiana in 1803, when the U.S. acquired the Louisiana-Missouri Territory. At that time, the governor appointed sheriffs, and it was not until 1847 that the office of sheriff became an elected position in Louisiana. Thomas Jefferson believed that the office of sheriff was the most important of all the executive offices in the country, saying, there is no honorable law enforcement authority in Anglo-American law so ancient as that of the county sheriff. As our country grew, the importance of the role of sheriff did so as well. In the 19th century, during the gold rush and cattle drives, America expanded westward and lawlessness reached an all-time high. This lawlessness continued during the Great Depression, and southern states were not immune. Louisiana sheriffs had it out with gangsters and thieves in some of our nation's earliest examples of real-life cops and robbers. One of the most infamous duos, Outlaws Bonnie and Clyde, were killed in 1934 on a rural road in Bienville Parish by a posse including Bienville Parish Sheriff Henderson Jordan, his deputy Prentice Oakley, and several Texas officers. While keeping the peace is still a critical function of the sheriff, the role of sheriff today has evolved into that of an administrator of multifaceted criminal, civil and tax, correctional and social services operation, often serving as one of the largest employers in the parish. Today, Louisiana sheriffs serve four-year terms with unlimited tenure. Unique to their nationwide counterparts, Louisiana sheriffs are the chief law enforcement officers, the chief executive officers of the court, and the official tax collectors for the parishes in which they serve. What makes a Louisiana sheriff unique? He or she has more constitutional authority and responsibility than any sheriff in the 50 United States. Our main goal in this uh, public uh, service announcement pertaining to the role of the sheriff is to, to make citizens in the state of Louisiana aware of what we do as sheriffs, aware of the functions of the office that, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis for you. The sheriff has always seemed to me that the sheriff is more responsive, a little bit closer to the people. He has to be elected every four years, and therefore he, uh, he goes out and uh, makes sure that his deputies are responsive to the needs of his, uh, his constituents. And so the title of sheriff and just the presence of a sheriff, to me, it uh, seems like it's just a little closer to the people, an elected official, and uh, we're there to serve and help uh, all the people in the parish. Even though uh, you have uh, the city police and you have other entities that help, the sheriff in, in my parish and most all parish are still the one that people will call when they need uh, help with their family member, when they need help with their elderly person, or they have a juvenile that's uh, giving them problems or they just got an issue about the, you know, their, their uh, ad valorem taxes or whatever, they want to usually talk to the sheriff. And sometimes in, in, uh, in our situation, they don't want to talk to uh, an assistant. They want to come and, and see the sheriff. In Louisiana, we're the only sheriffs that are uh, ex officio tax collectors. We're the keeper of the jail. We are the civil processor where we conduct sheriff sales and foreclosures. We are the officer of the court where the judicial system can operate in a uh, safe and uh, uh, appropriate manner. We, we collect fees. We disperse these fees. And frankly, uh, without, there's no room for margin of error. No, uh, you can't have any error omissions in that regard. So it's important, I would think, that you would look at a Louisiana sheriff in a, in a far broader view than just the most obvious, which is a chief law enforcement officer. And clearly, that's the one that most 
uh, our, our constituents identify us with, but it is much broader than that and uh, much more important, frankly, for the electorate to find a sheriff, with that man or woman, that uh, can frankly surround themselves with, with the talent to do the array of responsibilities that a sheriff has. When they see this star right here, I want them to feel, especially the youngsters, that this is somebody that uh, I know that can help me, not somebody that uh, is going to uh, be a detriment to me or, or do harm to me. So when you see the police car or you see a unit with that symbol, with that star, then I want them to feel these are some people who are going to take care of uh, my problem. There's a big difference between a sheriff's department and the office of sheriff. The office of sheriff created by the Louisiana Constitution and clearly throughout the country likewise is one that requires six or seven major duties and responsibilities. And the important distinction uh, I, I would offer is that a Louisiana sheriff and the office of the Louisiana sheriff has a connotation of independence and a sovereign nature. When you talk about a department, there is uh, some suggestion that it is a uh, subordinate to a, a government. And that's uh, clearly not the case with Louisiana sheriffs. Today, sheriffs in Louisiana serve four-year terms with unlimited tenure with many roles. He or she is the chief law enforcement officer of the parish. The sheriff is the CEO of the court. He or she is responsible for maintaining the safety and security of the court, take charge of juries when outside the courtroom, service of court papers, such as subpoenas, summons, warrants, and civil process, and prisoner extradition. The sheriff is the official tax collector of state and parish ad valerum taxes and other taxes and license fees as provided by the Louisiana Constitution. Policing, prosecution, corrections, probation, civil proceedings. A major responsibility of the sheriff is to maintain the parish jail. The sheriff also operates many programs for the citizens such as community outreach, seniors, triad, neighborhood programs, DARE, sex offender, victim notification, emergency response, JTF-7, SWAT, communication towers post-Katrina. The Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness offers a seat at its table during emergencies. Recruiting, hiring, and training deputies is another area the sheriff has the responsibility. Louisiana has 64 sheriffs, one in each parish. Let's look at some of these important responsibilities. One of the, the most important jobs that we do as sheriff uh, is house not only local prisoners, uh, but state inmates um, for the state of Louisiana. So we have in Calcasieu Parish about 1,200 inmates, uh, probably about 350 are, are state inmates. And the rest are prisoners um, from Calcasieu Parish who are either awaiting trial or have been sentenced uh, and are waiting either to be shipped off to DOC. Uh, but it could be, you know, we, we are the central jail for not only the Calcasieu Parish Sheriff's Office, but all our local municipalities uh, throughout our parish. You have to feed them, you have to house them, um, you know, the, 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 the medical expense, although that comes from the, from the parish, they, they give us money back for that, for housing these prisoners. Um, we still have to hire, you know, for my particular jail, you know, you're talking about 250, almost 300 deputies. Uh, to operate a jail with, for that size. So, you know, it is a, it is a big financial uh, obligation, not only to the sheriff, but to the taxpayers of our parish. You're housing these people, and to the public, it's, all right, they got them in jail. But to the families of the incarcerated, you have to understand they're worried about them, they're concerned about them. Uh, I've learned one thing as sheriff, mothers and fathers and grandfathers and, and grandmothers uh, and family love that person that's incarcerated regardless of the bad things that they've done and they want to ensure that you know that yes they may need to be in jail but that they're they're okay and they're so you know you kind of juggle that when families have issues with they're worried about maybe they have a medical problem or something wanting to come have a special visit or to you know so it's a balancing act and, and you know obviously when you have 1200 prisoners you can't let everybody just come and go to see their loved ones. You have to schedule that. and it's So it takes a lot of coordination uh, and a lot of effort for our staff to be able to schedule uh, just visitation for that many inmates. 
the sheriff is the manager or keeper of the jails in each parish. What that means is anyone that is incarcerated has to go under the sheriff's authority to be housed until prosecuted or unless they've already been sentenced in some other parish, they become a Department of Correction offender. As far as the financial pressures, they are huge. Um, and which the state gives uh, are a lot, $24.39 per offender. And what that has to accumulate as far as the housing, as far as the medical of an offender, as far as the feeding of a prisoner, and as far as um, paying for the guards that actually sit and um, actually manage the offenders there in the facility. So it gets to be kind of tough as far as a sheriff as far as managing jails. We provide the, the standard living as far as an offender to try to rehabilitate that offender to go back into society with the uh, knowledge of um, a basic standard of living with knowledge as far as reentry programs and various other things. So once they do adapt back to society, they have those fundamental things that would um, get them back into the community whereas they can live as re regular citizens. And, and with the hopes of not um, making those bad choices again. I put out uh, over 600 inmates every day out in the community working on public jobs for public entities. Uh, they work at England Air Park, uh, the airport, they keep the grounds out there, they provide uh, the, the labor, the inmate labor to the police jury, the city of Alexandria, city of Pineville, uh, Woodworth, the Indian Creek Recreation Area, uh, any public entity out there that needs inmate labor. And all that entity has to do is to reimburse me the cost of the guard. Uh, the work is, uh, is, is free. And it gives that inmate an opportunity to get out of that jail and go out into the community and get a little sunshine. And all the years that I've been working inmates out in the public, I've had very, very, very little trouble with them. Uh, they, they go out every day, they, you know, they're in the fresh air, they get exercise, they come in in the afternoon and uh, they uh, take them a shower, they eat and they go to bed. Uh, they're not just warehoused. And that program has worked out so well for us. But we couldn't, in Rapid East Parish, we could not function without that inmate labor. Uh, the entities that use these inmates, they can't afford. The police jury couldn't hire that much uh, labor uh, out of the public to come in. Their budgets just wouldn't allow it. Uh, the England Authority out there, which governs uh, uh, England Air Park, uh, we have four inmate labor crews that go out there. That's, uh, that's nearly 40 people that go out every day and work on those grounds. And they are absolutely beautiful. They're manicured. Uh, the England Authority couldn't hire that many people to come out and work. So that's one of the, the programs that, that we do. We teach uh, these inmates, uh, you know, just basic life skills, uh, how to do an interview to go for a job, how to balance a checkbook, uh, how to dress. Uh, a lot of these people, when they've been in jail eight or ten years, they either didn't know or they forget how to, what it's like on the outside. So we try to prepare them uh, to go out into the public and, you know, be a productive citizen and uh, it's, uh, it's worked very, very well. I did an average uh, on uh, the three uh, prisons that we have, and it cost me a little over $35 a day to uh, keep an inmate in, in those facilities. The state reimburses me a little over $24 a day, I believe it's $24.39, so I'm losing $10, $11 a day on every inmate that I have. But when you compare that to the service that they, they provide, uh, you know, I think it's a, a deal that uh, we can get by with that. Uh, on your pretrial inmates, that's the guys that's sitting there at the courthouse waiting for their day in court. I only get $4.75 a day to keep them, so that's a losing proposition there. Uh, when Huey P. Long Hospital closed in Pineville uh, a couple of years ago, that threw me into the medical business. Uh, that hospital provided all of our medical for our inmates, but when it closed, it was all dropped back on myself at the Sheriff's Department. It cost me a little over a million dollars a year just to provide medical care for those inmates. Now that's not counting the prescription medicine in, in, uh, that we have to provide for them, but just 24 hour medical in those three facilities cost me, it was, well when we, signed, when we signed the contract, it was a million and 30,000 dollars for last year. So it, it's a very expensive thing. You know, we've tried to work with some work release issues to, to help uh, alleviate the jail overcrowding that everyone has. Uh, we're doing some re-entry programs. We're looking at doing a re-entry program at, at our end of the state. We have not started that yet, but I know that the, the Department of Corrections has, uh, has really started looking into, in other areas, have already instituted some, some, um, some re-entry programs. They're working real well. So obviously, if we, can, if we can give these inmates some type of trade 
and some type of education, um, we don't want them back. The, the problem is we have such a recidivism rate that it's very, you know, our goal is we want them to be reformed and, and you know, they're going to jail, they deserve to be there, but the problem is we have such a, uh, you know, the, they, the same ones come back and come back. And so our goal is if we can get them some way of training to get them a job when they get out and try to get them some, uh, some help with most of their issues or drug or alcohol issues, then maybe, you know, we can, we can help our problem ourselves by trying not to, you know, for them not to come back to our facilities. Sheriffs work closely with the State Department of Public Safety and Corrections. Two things, really, two distinct things that we do with the sheriffs. One is house state prisoners at the local level. The other is emergency operations and, and what we do during hurricanes, floods, emergency situations at prisons and, and those sort of things. And the, the historical data on, on the housing uh, inmates at the local level is, goes back into the 80s and early 90s where we had three or 4,000 inmates working at the local level, or you know, housed at the local level. And uh, that, that began, we had federal court oversight back in the 90s, and, and uh, both from, from a jail standpoint and a state prison standpoint. And that, that ultimately ended up being uh, a settlement in which we did basic jail guidelines for the local level, and we did uh, American Correctional Association accreditation for the state prisons. And that's kind of how it got started, and it, at that time it was about 4,000 prisoners at the local level. Uh, and over time, you know, since that time, in, in the 1997, we adopted the basic jail guidelines, which basically is monitoring of the jails from, from our department standpoint. And, and what we do is monitor 104 jails where where we, uh, we use the basic jail guidelines standards, which is basically constitutional care, uh, in which people need to understand that. And we, we pay the sheriffs to house them at the local level. Uh, that has grown to 18,000, and you know, it's become a critical issue for us. In the 80s and 90s, the state couldn't afford to build prisons, couldn't afford to house inmates in our state prisons in the sense of the cost that was involved. That there was no capital outlay, no finance money to build prisons, and the sheriff stepped up at that point and, and became partners with the department and, and critical partners to the department. And, and uh, just to say that we really couldn't do without the sheriffs and, and their relationship that we had with them. So. You know, we, we've grown into that relationship. We've sort of outgrown ourselves to some extent in that we have 50% of our prison population, over 50% of our prison population, which today is about 19,000 offenders at the local level. So we've grown from 4,000 to 19,000 at the local level. And the issue with that is, is that the ones at the local level, not only are they 19,000 being housed, but discharge-wise, we discharge about 15,000 every year uh, at, you know, to, back to our communities, and 11,000 of those are coming out of our parish jails. We've established uh, re-entry centers in, in nine regions of our state where inmates going, coming out of our local jails go through re-entry centers before they're released. And what they do in re-entry centers is basically some programming, uh, not real extensive programming, but it's about a, a three-month deal where they, residential plans, uh, IDs, the basic necessities of what you need before you, you transition back to our communities. Sheriffs have to be prepared for any type of emergency in Louisiana. Sheriffs in Louisiana have to work together. Particularly in the Baton Rouge area, eight sheriffs have joined forces to create Joint Task Force 7 which is a multi-jurisdictional counter-terrorist task force. JTF-7 was created to protect the greater Baton Rouge area from acts of terrorism, both foreign and domestic. The Mississippi River has reached epic heights in flooding over the last few years. Louisiana sheriffs have worked in particular with JTF-7 in patrolling the river, making sure that the barges and infrastructure and the river is safe. This is very critical because when the water is at a high level and a barge is to break loose from its mooring point, it could cause a catastrophic event with the breaking or breaching of a levee. Ultimately, JTF-7 is responsible for the safety of the people living in the eight parishes surrounding Baton Rouge. JTF-7 is just one example of how sheriffs work together in Louisiana to keep our communities safe.
Uh, in Louisiana, the sheriff's the chief elected law enforcement officer of the parish, and uh, that's a huge responsibility. And, and at the end of the day, he's responsible for the safety and security of the citizens of the entire parish. Uh, not only the normal duties you think of as a sheriff is arresting uh, murderers and robbers and dope dealers and so forth. Uh, now, of course, with terrorists and all the other things the sheriffs have to be prepared for, uh, but also in disasters, man-made or natural. And right here in Bossier Parish last year, we had a historic uh, event with the Red River reaching a level it hadn't reached in over 70 years. And so and I know on the coast they deal with hurricanes, uh, tornadoes are a big issue. Uh, but of course, we're most familiar with the flood. But sheriffs have to coordinate. Uh, they, they manage and coordinate uh, with the Office of OEP, the levy boards, the city mayors, the police chiefs, the Corps of Engineers, the Highway Department, uh, the DOTD. Uh, anyone and everyone, is anything in that parish, the sheriff has to ultimately, at the end of the day, coordinate and do what's best for the citizens of his parish. Last spring, we experienced something here that uh, I've lived here my entire life, and we never experienced anything near what we'd done before. Uh, the Red River reached a historic level near historic level, the highest in 70 years of 37.14 feet. Uh, right now I'm about six feet tall and right here where I'm standing the water would have been over my head. Our building right over here uh, we sandbagged and uh, we sandbagged two feet higher than the recommendations and the water went over our sandbags by two feet. Uh, needless to say we had a lot of flooding up and down all the way from the Arkansas line all the way down to Loggy Bay on the south end of the parish. We had close to 100 homes that were affected and so it was a major event for us here in Bossier Parish. Obviously, the, the big fight is, is uh, maintaining, uh, getting the forecast, doing what we all we can to sandbag and prevent things from happening. But we had a lot of people that was too little too late for them. And so we had to help people move out. Uh, whatever we could do to make the thing as easy on them as we could, help them in any way. We had a few that sheltered at some schools uh, that we had to supervise and organize. Uh, sandbags, uh, the levee board needed help. Uh, we provided inmates to sandbag some of the levees where they had some boils. And so just whatever manpower, inmate labor, whatever we can do uh, to help situation that's what the sheriffs always step up and do. The sheriffs in my view are always there day or night they're the first ones to respond they're the last ones to leave and that's because of the, the responsibility that we have as the elected chief law enforcement officer in that parish everything comes under us in my view as far as public safety for our citizens it takes a lot of hard work with a lot of people we certainly can't do it alone alone but uh, coordinating working with other agencies before disasters happen, actually, you can't just wait till the building's burning down or the river's six feet over the levee before you start organizing and being prepared. But being prepared is, is the biggest part of this. I've been sheriff for St. John Parish at that time for just over a month. Hurricane Isaac took its toll on St. John Parish. We rescued 6,000 residents without one loss of life. The officers were out there rescuing citizens without hesitation. We thought we had all the answers, but we learned so much more, which has made us better prepared. We now have boats, generators, backup radio systems. We now have resources that are brought in to help us prepare for uniforms, food, shelter, rest for our accommodations for our men and women. We now have transportation. We do now meet with EOC directors frequently and often to make sure we repeat and plan and prepare for the best case and the worst case scenario. So at this point, uh, we learned a lot in Hurricane Isaac. We lost a lot in Hurricane Isaac, but I think we were much better prepared should another emergency uh, response of that sort is needed again. Hurricanes Katrina and those since have posed special challenges for Louisiana's sheriffs. In the aftermath of Katrina, obviously no singular agency had the assets or resources necessary to address the challenges that uh, Katrina presented as it related to the destruction of property and flooding and everything else. Uh, my office had to reach out to the Louisiana Sheriff's Office Ta Association Task Force uh, in order to backfill and to supplement the workforce that we had. Sheriff's offices across the state really are the only organization where we have the necessary boots on the ground uh, to address emergency response to any particular natural disaster or other types of disasters that are presented. The task force was an outgrowth of that understanding and, and knowing that they were going to have to backfill at some point in time if the event went three, four, five, six, or seven days. Um, so Katrina was a good example of the necessity of the LSA task force and, and being able to backfill 
because as I said earlier, no one singular agency has the assets or resources necessary. Here in St. Bernard Parish for Hurricane Katrina, uh, we, we wasn't noticed. It went unnoticed. People didn't know for days that we were flooded from levee to levee. Most of the focus was on the city of New Orleans, and, and which we understand. But our communication system was, was broken. Uh, we didn't even have operability within our own agencies inside of St. Bernard Parish. And today we have interoperability statewide. Uh, and that's important to communicate uh, when you have an event such as Hurricane Katrina or those type of events. Collecting taxes in the parish is another important responsibility of the Louisiana Sheriff. All sheriffs in the state of Louisiana have the responsibility for collection of some taxes, um, predominantly ad valorem taxes. In my uh, parish, I actually collect all taxes. There are about five or six of the sheriffs in the state uh, that collect more than ad valorem tax. Uh, so we play a very integral part on the business economic side of what goes on within our respective parishes uh, whether it is the ad valorem tax, property tax, whether it's sales tax, occupational license tax, and most uh, sheriffs all co also collect all of the fines and fees that are generated through the court system. So we have a financial component of our organization that's very important to the overall economic system in the state of Louisiana. That responsibility uh, is huge because that provides not only the funding for the sheriffs, but it provides funding for all of local government. Uh, you uh, may or may not know that we do not have a state ad valorem tax. So the state of Louisiana as a governmental entity is not a recipient of property taxes. It's all for local government. So that's what provides the necessary funding mechanism for all of the services that parishes provide throughout the state of Louisiana. Louisiana sheriffs partner with state and federal agencies to keep the public safe. Your sheriffs and all the sheriffs in the state of Louisiana have formed the Sheriff Institute. The Sheriff Institute trains all the deputies and themselves how to better do their jobs. That goes from executing the proper search warrants, knowing the proper law, whether to seize cell phones or whether to get a search warrant before they do so. The deputies are on the streets fighting every day to make sure that people are safe in their communities. And every day, new laws are coming out. And the Sheriff's Institute makes sure that not only the sheriff, but the deputies know what these laws are so they can abide by them. The value the Sheriff's Institute gives us is it helps the deputies to help the public in a legal manner. I'm Walt Green, the United States Attorney for the Middle District of Louisiana, and my office has partnered with the Louisiana Sheriff's Association for the last two years in educating children of all ages on law enforcement and, and gun safety. And primarily, the Louisiana Sheriff's Association has been a founding member of the Louisiana Law Enforcement for Gun Safety. This is where we, uh, the United States Attorney's Office, local police, constable's office, we go out and educate young adults and minors on gun safety. We, we've been able to get trailers and go out and de do demonstrations, and so far we've reached 28,000 children in the last two years. Sheriffs are critically important to the, the DOJ mission here in the Middle District. They're involved in several task forces which are critically important. One is the Human Trafficking Task Force, which they are, of course, a founding member as well, where we fight, prevent, and disrupt human trafficking in this district. Secondly, they're a member of two drug task forces, which we disrupt the drug trade, which is also incredibly important here in the Middle District, which we know stems and, and adds to violence in our district. And lastly, they're one of the founding members of the Joint Terrorism Task Force here in the Middle District, too. And again, that mission is to disrupt discover and prevent terrorism in the Middle District. The relationship between the chiefs of police and the sheriffs is a win situation for the public. What's most important is that all police agencies must work together. Uh, we all have the same goal and our goal is protection of the public, the community and better benefits for law enforcement personnel. We've worked with the staff of the uh, Sheriff's Association to form uh, partnerships on a number of fronts, legislative, um, administrative fronts, uh, training fronts, and uh, you know, we've worked a really close 
close relationship over the past dozen years or so. And uh, it's been extremely rewarding. And I think we've done a lot of good for the uh, people of this state. We've done a lot of good for the criminal justice system. Uh, we speak as a unified voice on matters of importance. And we work real closely together, number one, in, in the protection of the, cri the fire and explosion crimes. You know, in our state, uh, we have about 4,000 arsons that occur every year. Uh, so our working relationship with the local sheriffs and in, in providing the expertise of law enforcement, and, and in many cases, these arson investigations that we get into are very, very complicated. You know, and the sheriffs bring to the table a tremendous amount of technology, a tremendous amount of, of, of people uh, who can go out and assist our deputies in, in finding the people responsible for these arsons and putting together a very very, very good case. You know, if you talk to uh, the, the prosecution side of arson, uh, they'll tell you that, that if the law enforcement agencies don't do the best job possible, they can't get convictions in these arsons. So number one, we come together in that. Uh, secondary to that, uh, I think that we support the sheriffs very, very well uh, in their mission to house uh, prisoners. You know, the jails and correctional facilities across the state, are, it's very important we keep those safe and we work very closely with the sheriffs to bring about the right level of safety. We do joint inspections. We work together in, in, in building these facilities where they're safe. And I think the final component that we do is, you know, when you look at sheriffs, I mean, your sheriff is kind of your icon of your parish. I mean, the sheriff is the go-to uh, for any problem someone has, not only a, a crime problem, but just a social problem, you know, and, and, and sheriffs are involved in a lot of things with mentoring children, you know, helping schools, helping the elderly. Uh, and we partner with our fire safety messages with the sheriffs. You know, we've had sheriffs across the state that's embraced our smoke alarm campaign and they go hand in hand and install smoke alarms in needy people's homes and, and that project there uh, yields about 12 alerts a year in homes that otherwise wouldn't have a smoke alarm. It wakes these people up and gets these people out of home. So, you know, our partnership and relationship is really exemplary. I mean, it's one of the things I'm very proud of. Uh, I mean, I personally have every sheriff's cell phone number in my cell phone and, and they do as well. Uh, and it's that type of relationship that when a community has a problem, no matter how small it is, uh, the fire marshal can respond to those needs. The Louisiana Sheriff's Association, an offshoot of the Louisiana Peace Officers Association, has now known 70 presidents and four executive directors. Six Louisiana Sheriff's Association presidents have gone on to serve as president of the National Sheriff's Association. Sheriff N.H. DeBreton, East Baton Rouge, Sheriff Brian Clemens, East Baton Rouge. Sheriff C.A. Griffin, Iberville. Sheriff Gerald Watney, Iberia. Sheriff Don Hathaway, Caddo. And Sheriff Greg Champon, St. Charles Parish. Lafouche Parish Sheriff Craig Weber also served as NSA president. One sheriff went on to become executive director of the Louisiana Sheriff's Association. Al Turner. Sheriff Charles A. Fusilay Jr. was selected National Sheriff of the Year by the NSA in 1996. Sheriff Charles Fusilay Sr. and Charles Fusilay Jr. were the only father and son LSA presidents. Sheriff Daniel Edwards, fourth generation of sheriffs, his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. Sheriff Gordon Martin, 1964 to 65, and Sheriff Willie Martin, 2003 to 2004, were the only uncle and nephew presidents. Sheriff Gordon Martin served as a delegate in the Constitutional Convention in 1972, where the language was inserted at Sheriff Martin's insistence, placing the sheriff as the chief law enforcement officer of the parish. The history of sheriffs in Louisiana also shows an important legacy. In Louisiana, sheriffs have a proud tradition. Uh, in my family, uh, my great-grandfather was sheriff in 1898 in Tangipo Parish. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Millard Fillmore Edwards, uh, was sheriff in Tangipo Parish from 1928 to 1948. And his son, who was my father, uh, was also sheriff from 1968 uh, to 1980. And of course, I was elected sheriff in 2003, where I'm still sheriff now. So I'm a fourth generation sheriff in Tangeville Parish. I know that from the time I was born, both my mother and my father taught 
uh, all of our children, all of us, you know, that being a public servant is a tremendous responsibility and it's about helping people. It's not about uh, ourselves, it's about what we can do for our community and what we can do to help other people. And so anytime that you're in a public office, one certainly where you're the chief law enforcement officer of a parish and you can reach out and help family members, uh, whether it's uh, they're struggling, for example, someone may have an addiction in their family and they may need to try to find a resource, a place to maybe get someone into a rehab facility. You know, that's not uncommon these days and we try to do that uh, anytime we can. Certainly if someone's home is burglarized and you may have some type of uh, jewelry that may have some type of sentimental value, you know, and they really want you to try to find that piece of jewelry, we're not always successful. But when we can, you know, obviously the, the, the joy, the relief that you can bring someone, you know, is, is it's really a comforting to be able to do that for them. And just just to go out in the community and to, to visit with people and anytime they have a concern or a comment and they can sit down and address it with you and you can listen to them and you can try to put yourself in their shoes and empathize with them and then you can try to do the best that you can to help them. I think that uh, you know being sheriff and taking your job seriously is an awesome responsibility but it's an opportunity to serve the public probably uh, is one of the best and most awesome uh, responsibilities you can ever have. Community relations is a key component of the Office of Louisiana Sheriff. Sheriffs throughout Louisiana have a variety of uh, public service programs. One of the greatest things in St. Landry Parish is our Crime Stoppers program. Uh, we interact with the public, we get information from the public, and our program has been so successful. In the last two years, we've had nine people turn themselves in after listening to our public information officer give his spill about how important it is to work with us and the community in solving crime. You got it. Come on. You can do it. One of our major community outreach programs is Sheriff Safety Town. We've uh, built this, this building, we built the facades, we built the whole thing using uh, some money from the sheriff's office, but the bulk of it was used, uh, that was used came from community support, from businesses, individuals, organizations. So we're very proud of not only the results that we've had, but also how it was done. The program works, it's unique in the fact that it's for second graders is the primary focus. And the second graders go through a two-week safety curriculum in the schools and then after the two-week safety curriculum, they come out here for a field trip. This is, although it's fun, it's not a playground or it's not a park or it's not a, something like an amusement ride. It's where they actually learn different things when they're driving the cars and driving the bicycles and, and walking on the streets. They're learning things, and that's what we're most proud of. Everybody look left, right, left before you cross. So as soon as it changes, I want you to look left, right, left, and you're going to stay between the white lines. What the children learn here at Safety Town is a variety of things. We teach them about vehicle safety, about pedestrian safety, about bicycle safety, gun safety, uh, safety during storms. We have a tornado house here that's, that is really unique to, to ours. Uh, I've got just many, many things that I'm... Uh, didn't even name water safety, uh, safety around gas rigs because we have so many gas wells in our area and, and, and uh, oil wells. Uh, there's safety programs that deal with electricity in case there's a storm and the power lines are on the ground. So we, we cover so many things and it's, a, it's like I say, it's redundant compared to what they have seen over the last two weeks in their, in their classrooms. And so it, it just reinforces it with a field trip. This is the only effort like this in the state of Louisiana, and we're very proud of it. We're proud that there's been 42,000 second graders that have been through this program. And we're also proud of the relationship we have with the Shreveport Fire Department, the Police Department, and the State Police, who are our partners in this, as far as teaching the kids. So the kids not only see law enforcement, see the fire services as their friends, but it gives us a chance to work together as organizations and agencies, and that, that's quite a plus. DARE stands for Drug Abuse, resistance education. When I started teaching there in 1990, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have multimedia. We didn't have social media. I had a, a young guy. He was very quiet. He never said a word. And it came time to write the essay. And he had written his paper. It was about three sentences. You're supposed to write, well, it was about five sentences. You're supposed to write a whole page. So I went to the teacher and I said, you know, this is really not going to be acceptable. 
And she shook her head. She said, Sheriff Stone, I mean deputy, I was deputy at that time. Deputy Stone, you don't understand. This is the first time he has written anything in his school career, ever. He never would write anything. He was in there as a special ed student, you know, an in inclusion student. First time he had ever written or attempted to write anything at all. Well, that lets you know what kind of uh, response that you get from the kids there at the school. So very proud of, of D.A.R.E. in Louisiana, very proud of all the D.A.R.E. officers. It's a dedication. It takes a lot of work to go into the schools and teach the D.A.R.E. program. We have an opportunity to, to do some unique uh, things, and I think one of the things that uh, in my office we um, identified some areas that I thought was needed in my community, and we formed what I call the Community Service Division. I have three ladies that certified uh, social workers that work in that division, and that particular division houses the FINS program, Families in Needs of Services, uh, the truancy program, try to make sure the kids stay in school, and uh, they work in those groups, and also the, uh, they work with the victims of domestic violence. The sheriff has an awful lot of responsibility, and I think in these times of um, crime, it's important that the business community work closely with the sheriffs so that we can improve the safety of our school children, so we can help work with the sheriff in a positive way to eradicate some of the bad guys and the bad neighborhoods in our communities. Our sheriffs and the association have come a long way in recent years and to see the kind of cooperation they have with the state police and everybody working together, I think has made law enforcement much better in the state of Louisiana. Many of our sheriff's offices are now becoming accredited. They're working about being more professional, about doing the right thing for their citizens. But law enforcement is just one part of their job. I mean, they got to collect taxes and do all kinds of other things and run these jails and try to run them within their budgets. And so being a sheriff, in my mind, is kind of a difficult task these days. They've got a lot of challenges. And I think the more the business community can rally behind them and understand what their issues are and try to help them, the more sense it makes for each of our communities. The primary role of the sheriff is to be responsive to the people that he serves to listen to the people that he serves, to be as trained as we possibly can to provide those services that our people uh, deserve. And also to help maybe make those youngsters feel positive when they see this star, make them feel positive that this person is not your enemy, this person is gonna be somebody I can count on, somebody I can depend on, he is your sheriff. I'm always reminded of the deputy sheriffs, the men and the women who serve you, who serve us on the front lines for public safety. So while we're talking about specifically the role of the sheriff, uh, it is most important that we not forget how important the role of the deputy sheriff is throughout this process. When we at the Louisiana Sheriff's Association talk to sheriffs about the role of the sheriff, we, uh, we're very proud to say that the majority of their work is serving the public in, in many different ways, in, in ways in which we feel enriched because we get to help people. So I hope you understand that regarding the complexities of this job, and there are many, and there are many facets of the job, our pride and joy is serving you, the citizens of, of Louisiana. The Louisiana Sheriff's Association says it this way, to preserve the office of sheriff as chief law enforcement officer and to maintain the status of sheriff as professional peace officers. With a cooperative spirit of commitment and energy, the LSA serves all sheriffs throughout the state to bring about effective influences to the communities they serve. For more information, please contact the Louisiana Sheriff's Association. We're having a great cook-off here to pick the king or queen of the Louisiana uh, seafood that will be the reigning king or queen this year um, and for the best dish. And uh, this is a great experience here with the wine and food experience. It, um, it brings our people and our food together. And the greatest ingredients in our food here in Louisiana is the people. 
uh, you can see by each of these chefs, uh, it's not only wonderful dishes they prepare, but it's their personality, it's that flair, it's that passion they have for what they're preparing that makes their food just a little special compared to anything anywhere else in the world. This is a great opportunity for chefs from across Louisiana to really show off their skills with seafood. You know, each area of the state kind of has its own personality and its own seafood that it loves. And so this is a chance to put them head to head and find out who's really got something that's going to catch the judge's attention. And then the nice thing is the winner becomes our king of seafood and they travel with us and act as an ambassador for us for the next year and help us educate people about the importance of domestic seafood versus the imported. So we're really going to be talking about uh, know better, eat better, and they're going to be part of America's Seafood Coast Guard, the real spokesperson for that. Today uh, we're going to be prepared, uh, preparing alligator on a stick with uh, grana volet uh, roots and uh, garfish tasso. And you're going to start this uh, right from the beginning with the alligator. That's it, right, from, right out of the gates, you know. So it should be very interesting. What's your history with uh, catching alligators? Uh, I've done a lot of hunting with uh, gators, uh, you know, through throughout my life. Uh, every September uh, I get a chance to go hunting alligators and it's uh, it's pretty fun. What's your uh, inspiration for this dish? You know I'm a little bit different you know I grew up on the uh, on the bayous and uh, of uh, South Louisiana Bayou Lafourche so uh, the seafood that I'm used to used to have is a lot of freshwater flat lake crabs, alligator, shoe pick, garfish you know people don't recognize that as regular seafood but it is uh, indeed uh, a seafood so I did something that's close to my roots that represents me, it's alligator. What's your recommendation to uh, someone at home that would like to start cooking with uh, Louisiana seafood? Well, you know, don't be scared, you know, it's, uh, read a lot about it. Uh, let the ingredients speak for themselves, you know, shrimp are wonderful, oysters are wonderful, just left, just left alone, you know, if the, uh, you know, to me nothing beats uh, an oyster right out of the shell and you, and you suck it right out of, the, out of the shell. To me, that's the best way to eat the oyster. It's, a, it's an homage to Chef Paul. We're doing uh, pure Louisiana seafood gumbo. It's truly seafood andouille, and then we're doing shrimp, crab, crawfish, and oysters inside the andouille, so that's the gumbo in an hour, and then we're bronze and redfish. It's gonna go on a Cajun barbecue sauce, and then a lump crab and snow pea shoot salad with a little lemon thyme vinaigrette right on top. What was your inspiration for this dish? Uh, honestly, it really is going back to Chef Paul. And it, you know, from, from 1984, when he kicked off that book at the uh, for the press in New York City in the World Trade Center where I was doing my internship to today, that's, I just had to do it and that's my, my inspiration and a mentor. What do you think about Louisiana seafood? What separates it from other seafoods from uh, other places? You know, to be honest, it's, it's the most freshest seafood out there. When you can all year long pull from shrimp and crab and crawfish and oyster, I mean, it's just, and then, and then start talking about the drum and the redfish and the speckle and, and everything. It's just, it's amazing. It's no way to explain it, what we have, the bounty we have to work with every single day. Today I'm making a poncho train chiffonon salad with a butter bean and pea puree, marinated jumbo crab meat, marinated crab claws, and marinated giant Louisiana shrimp, some julienne vegetables, and we're going to finish it off with a fried shrimp chip, and because I love to fry everything, a little bit of fried butter beans as well. How did you come up with this idea? I don't think we eat enough salad here in South Louisiana. All of our vegetables are always covered in heavy cream and butter and cheese. So I decided to use a little bit of that Louisiana seafood on a hot afternoon to make sure that it was able to, you're able to tolerate all those vegetables. What's your favorite uh, part of cooking with Louisiana seafood? My favorite part of cooking with Louisiana seafood is buying the Louisiana seafood. I love going to the seafood market. I love talking to people, learning about where the food came from, and then the look on people's faces whenever you serve a 10 count shrimp, they get super excited and that makes me happy too. What's your uh, recommendation for people at home when they wanna cook some uh, Louisiana seafood? My recommendation for people at home when it comes to cooking Louisiana seafood is be fearless. Go for it. Don't be afraid to try something new, but make sure you let that beautiful, delicate, sweet seafood speak for itself in the dish. I am cooking up a Bayou Trio, and it has a combination of alligator and shrimp and crawfish in there. How'd you come up with the idea for this? Well, I like stew, so part of it's going to be a stew, part of it's going to be a play on a crab cake and cornbread, so who doesn't like that? Tell us, what do you enjoy the most about cooking with Louisiana seafood? I love the freshness. The flavor comes through. It does not take a lot of masking or seasonings. Just let that beauty come, just come on through in whatever dish you make. 
What kind of tips do you have? Have fun, buy fresh Louisiana seafood. I'm doing a pecan crusted redfish with some harcovert and a um, uh, sweet potato hash. How'd you come up with the idea to do this? Um, when I was a kid, my dad used to take us fishing all the time, and one of our favorite things to catch was redfish. And uh, so redfish just to me was what I wanted to do. And then I just started putting things together, and it's flavor some profiles that I like, and I feel it goes well together. What separates Louisiana seafood from other seafood? Um, I mean, other than it's the best seafood in the world, um, you know, I just think that it's not only is it seafood, which, you know, of course, is, can be found anywhere in the world, but, uh, I mean, the way that we present it and the spices and the flavorings we use is unique to anywhere else in the world. I mean, you're not going to get seafood like you get here. Anywhere. If somebody wants to start out uh, cooking seafood for the first time, what would you tell them? Um, just have a passion for it. As long as you love what you're doing, it'll always come out right. I mean, that's just, that's the basis of it. Just love what you're doing and put love into it and you'll get a great dish. I'm doing a sous vide black and grouper with uh, two purees, a fava bean puree, a sweet potato puree, and a uh, corn and crab salsa. How'd you come up with the idea for this? Um, I took a trip to Italy not too long ago and I ate some good fava beans and just uh, love grouper and uh, have been using sous vide for a while. So all those kind of things that just kind of came together at once. What's it like to cook with Louisiana seafood? Uh, it's the best, best in the world. I mean, so, you know, we get to cook with the best product we, uh, we have available to us. So I, I think it's great. It's, all, it's amazing. What about tips for the chef at home? Um, take your time, you know. Uh, don't ever think that you can't do anything uh, out of your bounds. Just, you know, keep trying. I want to thank all the chefs for participating in this. And I look forward to working with you to promote Louisiana tourism across the country and the world. Whether it be the king or the queen, um, I'm sure we'll have a great year of promoting Louisiana seafood and tourism around the world. So good luck to y'all, and may the best man or woman win. Great job. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Third place in the ninth annual Louisiana Seafood Cook-Off goes to Chef Mark Quitney. Yes. Yay! Mark and Mark. Thank you. Yeah. All right, y'all, it's second place. Man, I'm just as nervous like I was a competitor. Second place in the ninth annual Louisiana Seafood Cook-Off goes to Chef Scott Varnado. We have a tradition here at the Louisiana Seafood Cook-Off where the winner has to take a knee, and he's crowned by the outgoing king of Louisiana Seafood. First place goes to Chef Blake Phillips, oh. Restaurant Sage, oh. my hometown, Monroe, Louisiana. Yes. Oh. All right, man, you got to take a knee, brother. Oh. Look at that. Great job, Chef. Amazing event, excited to, uh, to promote Louisiana Seafood and uh, my restaurant, Restaurant Sage, and just, you know, our, our kitchen culture as chefs. What does Louisiana Seafood mean to you? Uh, it means the most important thing to me, you know, it gives me my job, it gives me a sense of being, it's, it's the reason why I cook, so, uh, you know, it would only being from Louisiana can you, do you get to have that experience. Anytime you, you medal or, or, or win in a competition, uh, you're always excited, it's a good thing, and, uh, and you know, to be able to compete in a seafood competition uh, over the years and promote something that I'm so passionate about, it's nice to be rewarded for it. What does Louisiana seafood mean to you? Well, like uh, like the other chef was saying, um, you know, it's it, it, it provides us a uh, an opportunity to have jobs, uh, but it also it's there, there's so much heritage behind the seafood from you know growing up and fishing and spending time with family on the water and it's just you know it's it's it, it, there's a lot a lot a lot going on that that means so much and it's, it's a lot of it's based around seafood. You know, for me, old school. It proves that. 
It proves that what we can do, what you could do 30 years ago, 40 years ago, still lives today. We can make it relevant and we can make it taste good. And it, for me, it's my mentor going back to Chef Paul. And that's really what tonight was about. And to be able to put those flavors together and say, look at us on a plate, I'm very, very proud. Extremely proud. Oh, it's great. I mean, look at the energy in this room. Um, you know, there's a reason why uh, the logo of Louisiana is Pick Your Passion. Uh, everybody here, every dish, uh, whether it's a restaurant or a, a group selling wine, they have a love and passion for what they do. And that's what makes it special to live and visit Louisiana. Louisiana is the premier seafood in the United States. I mean, when you talk about sustainability, variety, and vibrance, we've got it all right here. Our waters are the richest in the United States. So for us, seafood's in our blood. Well, I love Louisiana seafood. It's the best seafood in the world. I filmed my show, uh, flipped my food here, all over the state of Louisiana. And I love the shrimp, the crab, all the great <laughs> seafood that comes out of the waters here. And I'm here to represent and support today and looking about having a good time. What separates Louisiana seafood from other seafoods around the world? One single word, flavor. How about two words, flavor, baby? <laughs> oh, it's great. Let, let me tell you what. You know, a fat man comes prepared. I am prepared to eat. You know, you guys, if you're watching this, I don't know why you're not here, because you should come here and be prepared to eat. It's Louisiana Seafood Promotion and Marketing Board, and our whole task is to really promote that Louisiana seafood. And, you know, this is such a big industry for Louisiana. It's part of our culture, and our job is to be sure that people really recognize that difference, understand that quality product we've got for America's second largest seafood producing state. You can go all over the world and eat food, but when you put the food and the ingredients together with the Louisiana fresh out the Gulf, there's none better. So uh, as we've been on a mission since the BP oil spill to make people realize not only that it's safe to eat, but how delicious it is, I think it's added to our ability to attract tourism and bring people here and realize how special the seafood of the Gulf of Mexico really is. And uh, that's been a great pleasure of mine to be able to promote that just back from Canada and the people up there that we will visit, the Torres, can't wait to come to Louisiana for the people, the food, the music, but that Louisiana seafood always seems to reel them in. Oh, just thrilled. It's so exciting every time we come and you see these chefs and they, as soon as they sign up, they start calling us and they're excited. We do an Instagram competition where they take over our Instagram and you start seeing their personalities coming through and what they're going to be bringing when they're competing today. So by the time we all get here, there's a lot of excitement. If people have questions or like more information, what should they do? They can go to our website, louisianaseafood.com, and get all the answers there. There's great recipes, so you want to try, you know, brushing up your game a little bit, it's a good place to go. And there's also a website for the seafood cook-off, too, so they can check that out and be able to look back at the chefs who competed. This has been the Louisiana Hometown Network. If you would like more information, please contact us.